Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar presentation. My name is Philip Payne. I am the technical lead for the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DOD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, or DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments it presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. Our organization supports those working in cybersecurity and the information systems domain of DOD research and engineering. We do this by help navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. In addition, we provide research and analysis services to help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar and it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improve DOD cybersecurity and information systems, science, and technology. Before we get started today, um, I just want to note a couple of administrative items. First, if you are dialed in by phone and would like a copy of the slides, they were posted to the CSI webinar announcement. You can go to csiac.org forward slash webinars and find today's webinar. Uh, when you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say to view to view to view today's slides, please click here. Uh, secondly, all participants are muted, but feel free to chat using the attendee chat button on the left hand side of the webinar screen. Uh, you can use this feature to chat with each other and I will be monitoring that chat as well. However, if you'd like to pose a question for the Q&A session at the end, please use the audience questions tool at the top center of your screen. That is gonna be the little icon that looks like a chat bubble next to the file folder. At the end of the presentation, I will go over the Q&A. For the benefit of those on the phone, I'll read the question out loud to the presenter. Uh, lastly, if you have any technical issues during the presentation, have no fear, the full presentation will be available online. Uh, please check back on the CSI, CSI website. Uh, once the webinar is posted, the GoToWebinar button will take you to the YouTube link. And with that said, I'll hand it off to today's presenter. Thank you, Phil. Um, my name is Anthony Hoogs. I'm the Vice President of Artificial Intelligence at Kitware, which is a small software R&D company that does a lot of computer vision, visualization, medical image analysis, and a few other things. I've been working in computer vision for over 30 years. Uh, so a fair warning, this is mostly going to be a talk about visual data, uh, imagery, and video. Uh, there are other aspects, uh, other data and analytics that, that we do at Kitware and that I have expertise in, uh, but uh, I'm not at all a, a cybersecurity person. Uh, so. Uh, this is going to be uh, a little bit of a different topic than you might see uh, normally in this webinar series. Um, but it, hopefully it will be relevant for, for this community uh, because a lot of what we're doing here is about general AI uh, and how to make that accessible to, to the average user. The goal of our work that I'll talk about today is to make AI viable and customizable for an individual user without having a researcher or even an AI engineer supporting that researcher. I encourage questions, so please do uh, put them in, in the uh, questions level, as uh, Phil noted. Um, I'll try to answer them as I go along, or if they're more involved, we might need to wait uh, until the end of the presentation. So there'll be three parts to this, this webinar. Um, first, a little bit about what I mean by do-it-yourself artificial intelligence. Um, and then some aspects of, of this work that are particularly unique to what, uh, what Kitware has done on a number of these government efforts that I'll talk about. Uh, there are lots of tools out there for what's now called machine learning operations. Uh, tools like Amazon, uh, SageMaker, a uh, variety of equivalent tools now from Microsoft and Google. So you might wonder why, why we would talk about this at all. And one of the main reasons is that everything I'm going to talk about here is fully open source. It's open source with permissive licensing, 
It's uh, God's products. This is all work funded by the government, primarily NOAA and, and DARPA, as, as indicated there. Uh, so all of these tools, um, there's URLs in the presentation here. You can go to these, these websites and download the software and, and try it out uh, for yourself. And then I really would love for, for people to do that. We're trying to get as many people uh, using these works and communicate, communi contributing to these open source communities as possible. All right, so let's dive in a bit. Uh, what is do-it-yourself uh, artificial intelligence, at least for today's purpose? Well, typically someone has a, a large pile of data. In this case, we're going to be looking at imagery and video, but now uh, there's a ton of uh, wonderful work in, in natural language. There's been some breakthroughs recently there. Uh, and, uh, and of course, there's all kinds of structured data and combinations of all these things together, multimedia data. Um, so typically people want to know what's in my data. Uh, how many objects do I have in there? If it's visual data, how many events uh, might be in there and things like this. Uh, longer term, over time, are there trends in the data? If I'm looking at a common location, uh, over time, and then what is what is typical and what what is unusual in my data? And a lot of times, though, people don't know what AI can do. Right, so an average user, an engineer, or or just an analyst uh, out there working his his job in, in the government or elsewhere um, doesn't necessarily even know what's possible with AI these days. The field is so rapidly evolving that new things are possible virtually every day. So it's very difficult to keep up, and you don't really need to keep up. You just need to know tools from, say, two or three years ago that would be useful to you. And even finding that out is very difficult. There's so much being published, literally 200,000 papers in AI a year these days in some cases. It's just, it's just insane how many, um, how many works there are out there. So it's very hard to find out what it is that's applicable to you, which algorithm you might use, uh, is it likely to work for you, work on your data, and things like this. But in the end, what you want is something that you can use and customize for your problems and give you the analytic results to help you do your job. So we haven't solved all of these problems. I'm not claiming uh, this at all, but but we have some tools that, that might be able to help you uh, across a pretty reasonable range of, uh, of problems. So do-it-yourself AI as we see it is a way for end users to build these customized AI solutions to very specific problems because many analysts have very specific problems. Uh, without any programming or any knowledge of how the underlying algorithm would operate. You don't need to be an AI expert to use any of this stuff, and you don't need to be scripting things or programming in Python. Right? So the full user interface is uh, developing custom AI for, for your problem. Now, one way to do this is exhaustive labeling. Uh, you might have tons and tons of data, and you might have lots and lots of labels that you can create where labels are examples. You're going to teach the machine what it is you want it to find. Um, that can be quite tedious. Right? So there's lots of tools out there that'll allow you to label things and build AI systems that, that understand those labels and find new instances of similar things. Um, but we have ways to shortcut that process and make it much more efficient. Uh, but typically, there's a library of AI algorithms uh, shown on the left. Uh, in our case, I've listed a few that are in some of the tools I'm going to talk about today. And then we have the user providing some sort of uh, input. Um, there is labeling, typically. Uh, in a normal system, you would have to label a bunch of data to get reasonable performance. We have ways that allow you to interactively build up a label set very efficiently. Uh, then you need sometimes you need to choose an algorithm that, that's going to run on this data and which one do I choose and how do I know? Uh, we have some methods to help you with this. Uh, and then we won't really want to get to that goal of producing the analytic results uh, over there uh, on the right. So a lot of the work I'm going to talk about here was funded by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Within that uh, here in the Department of Commerce, inside of NOAA, there is the National Marine Fisheries Service. And they have a set of science centers scattered around the country that came together years ago in 2014 uh, to look at computer vision and how it could help them. And this is because uh, these NOAA Fisheries Science Centers had a bunch of scientists who were collecting a lot of, of imagery and video data to do population assessment for all kinds of different wildlife, typically underwater, 
but sometimes above water and on shorelines and things like this. Typical pattern for them would be to create a sensory system. So literally build a camera rig that would be put into the water. Go out on a boat uh, for say a week, two weeks or three weeks, maybe once or twice a year and collect a ton of data in this mission. So go out, put out a bunch of cameras, leave them in the water for hours or days, pick them up again and do this for your crews for 10 or 20 days and then come back. So they would come back with troves of this video data and then spend the next number of months analyzing that data and producing those important population assessments, then going out and do it again. So that analyzing the data part was very time consuming. They'd go through all the video frames and literally count the fish by species that they found in those frames. And some of the video that's, that's involved in this process is shown here. So they knew early on that computer vision could help and we've been working with them uh, as well as others for years to try to allow computers to help them. And along came deep learning in the midst of this. And we were well prepared because we'd already been working on solutions before deep learning, uh, which really hit the research world in 2013, 2014. And uh, by 2017 or so, we had a deep learning uh, initiative going with NOAA to um, do this do-it-yourself AI for their problems. And this culminated in this Yami system that I'll, that I'll talk about and another one called CoralNet, which I'll only mention here uh, for classifying coral in, in images of, uh, of coral reefs that come the water. Um, and for this work, the, the folks at NOAA who put this together and have guided our work won the uh, Department of Commerce's highest technical achievement award in 2019. So the system we built for, for NOAA is called uh, Viami video and image analytics for the machine environment. It's a do-it-yourself system. It was originally built for the marine environment, but it really can be used for any sort of imagery or video. And now other forms of data as well, beyond images and video too. And as I mentioned before, we don't require any programming or machine learning or AI knowledge or experience. And this is being used by a bunch of scientists um, they might be technical folks, a wide range of ability on computers and programming there. Um, but in general, they're not programmers. They're not AI researchers. Uh, they just want a tool they can download and use and fit into their workflow. So Viami uh, does this for them. Uh, because it was sponsored by NOAA, we were able to do it in a fully open source system with a permissive license. Permissive here means that anyone can use it for pretty much any reason. It's a BSD style license, if you know what open source licenses look like, but it doesn't have any strings attached to it. So it's not a, G, it's not a, um, a license that say restricts commercial use, which many of them do. Um, it doesn't say for research purposes only, which many of them do. So it's intended to be a very broad uh, system that people can use for any purposes, including even making money. You could build a business on it if you wanted to. So it has a variety of capabilities in it, uh, the algorithms that, that are hosted by, by Viami and new ones are being added all the time as, as new um, ways to do object detection better and imagery come along. Um, but there's also this, this key bit here in the second column, the video search and rapid model generation, which allows customization quickly to user specific problems and do a lot of labeling very quickly. The system allows you to go fully end to end and label data uh, and, uh, and build your own detectors and try them out, add more labels and continue iterating until you have a, a solution that meets your needs. There's other things in here that are a little more specific to the marine environment, such as stereo. If you have two cameras that are set up in a stereo pair, then they can um, be calibrated together and um, you can use this to measure 3D information, such as the length of the fish. So there's a few different ways in, in Viami to, to do uh, this, this type of do-it-yourself uh, AI. So on the left here, uh, you take your input data and you can just run existing detectors and trackers on it and see if it works. So within Viami, there's a set of detectors for things like fish. Just as you might have uh, on, the, on the web, you can easily find existing pre-trained deep learning models to detect people, cars, and aircraft, and so on. Um, Viami has a, a set of those, uh, and it has ones that have been trained specifically on, on fish. 
uh, and a wide variety of species of fish. Uh, so that might work for you. Right? So you might have a, a, just a library of existing stuff that, that solves most of your problem or all of it. And this is kind of common. But whatever your problem is, there, there might be a model that already has been developed for this uh, and is free for you to use. Um, but often it's, it's not good enough uh, or um, you have a specialized problem and things like this. So you want to be able to improve a model or make a model, a detector model that is uh, more suitable for your own needs. So a typical way to do that is shown here in the uh, in the next box uh, towards the lower bottom, you know, the new annotations or annotation correction. And that says, well, I, I'm going to annotate more data. So maybe I, there's a class of objects in my set that, that didn't exist in my the detector I was using. So I need to add a new class or two. And to do that, you find instances of the class and you add these labels, which are typically a bounding box uh, on the image uh, showing instances of that object. So this is a, a straightforward process. Many tools support this. We do annotations. You can do this for, say, hundreds of instances of your object or even thousands across a wide range of conditions that are going to appear in your data. Uh, and then you can do deep learning training and build a detector for it. So that's a pretty standard way to do it. Uh, but over on the right here um, is this new classifier training via IQR. IQR stands for Iterative Query Refinement, which I'll talk about a little bit uh, in more detail. And in this case, uh, you, you want to build a detector for a, a, an object. You don't have one yet, but you have an instance of this object in your data, and you can see. And you can start with a single instance and iteratively find more instances automatically in the data set and use this to build up your classifier very quickly and explore your data. And this gives you a lot of labels very quickly in an iterative loop where you can get a bunch of instances. The system finds them automatically. You pick out the ones that are correct tell it which ones are wrong, it learns on the fly with you how to detect this object that you're interested in. Uh, so we'll talk about this process uh, in more detail. There's a bunch of user interfaces in Viami. It is a web-based system, which is uh, getting more and more um, functional in each, each uh, day. And then there's a desktop version of this, which has a bit more functionality, uh, but does require uh, more of a thick client model. Um, there's a bunch of command line tools and APIs if you want to program. So I won't go into detail on these things, but there are a set of user interfaces uh, that are pretty robust and provide a lot of capability um, without doing any programming at all. So much. But if you want to get into the programming side of things, it's all there. Right? So you have a lot of work that, uh, that can be put in. So we have a bunch of algorithms which are pretty um, well-established algorithms in the computer vision world for detecting objects such as uh, YOLO, you only look once, version three, version four, it's now version five, which is probably in there. Um, there's segmentation algorithms to, to pick out which pixels exactly correspond to an object and not just a bounding box around the object. Uh, there's specific detectors, in this case, in the lower right, for things like scallops uh, and fish. And because it's a community around Viami, people are building models and contributing detectors all the time. So there's detectors for hundreds of species of fish uh, in this particular um, instance of Yami that we, that we run out of fitware. But you know, you're probably not interested in fish, but, but that's just an example of the kind of ecosystem that can be developed here. If you have a bunch of folks who are working on similar problems and you have a coordinated enterprise, you can contribute your models and your labels to that, to a common, repository so that everyone else can benefit from them and use them. They can use your models or they can use your labels to, to create or update their own models. And this is a, the way the deep learning world uh, is evolving uh, across even some government labs uh, like this one. And the, the cross-pollination across these different groups uh, contributing their, their data and labels into a common AI ecosystem is very powerful. All right, so the way that the system works that I'm going to talk a little more about, interactive query refinement, is that you have a bunch of data shown here in the middle. Uh, and that data is ingested. So there's a, there's a big step where you say, you know, eat my data to the to the system. And it you point it at a bunch of data, uh, typically in a bunch of files, or database, and it does some behind the scenes magic. And you don't, don't know what it is uh, as a user, and it doesn't really matter to you. Um, but it's basically taking those pixels or raw data, whatever it is, uh, and it could be text or some other things, different systems. Right now, we just support imagery here, but 
analogously, this is uh, any form of, of data. And it's, uh, it's indexed into a way that the system can understand it better than the raw data, the raw pixels, the raw characters in a, in a text, things like that. Okay, so there's some magical index built behind the scenes here out of this big pile of data. And then on the left, we have a query image. And let's say we want to find aircraft that look like this one, or maybe general aircraft, but we just have this one example of an aircraft. And what we want is to build up an aircraft detector using this one example, and then looking at this big pile of data. And then um, out of it, we want to get a bunch of examples of aircraft, as well as a detector and classifier trained on those aircraft. And that's what IQR allows us to do. So we have this take, it'll do all these steps I just mentioned. It'll take this big pile of data and allow you to query it from a single example and then build the detector and classifier uh, starting with that uh, bootstrapping from that, so that single example. All right, so the way that works, it's a little more technical, is we take that source data up here on the left and we convert this to feature vectors. In the deep learning sense, that means running it through a deep, deep learning network uh, and peeling off one of the feature layers. Uh, typically one of the fully connected layers towards the uh, higher levels of the network. And then we put that into a feature vector archive. And we don't just have a pile of vectors there. We want to do clever indexing on this. Because typically these, these vectors are thousands of dimensions, 1K or 4K uh, dimensionality. Um, and we might have millions of them. So we, we build an archive here uh, that allows us to rapidly find vectors that are close to one another. The query image then is converted to a feature vector. And then we take that feature vector in the query and we look at in that archive and find all the other feature vectors that are similar. It's a very simple lookup process initially, at least conceptually here. I find all of the vectors that are similar and similar feature vectors should have similar content in the image. That depends on the quality of the conversion to that feature vector, but for something like a good deep learning network today, that's going to be pretty good. Right? You're going to have really decent representation of that image content in that feature vector and we're going to find stuff that is similar to that image uh, through this process so that gives us a set of of images that are returned and some of those might be correct and some of them might not they might not match my query uh, they might match my query so i'm going to look at those images as a user and i mark the ones that i like uh, positively i say yep those are good and i mark the ones that are not what i want and say don't give me more of those and then ones that I'm not sure about, I can just leave blank. And that's called giving feedback. So it's feedback round one here. And then I just push a button in Viami which says refine. And the system on the fly builds a classifier. It's actually not even a deep learning classifier here, but a traditional classifier that takes that feedback you gave it and applies it to this, to the set of results and the feature vectors in those results. And it builds a classifier which now learns to differentiate the stuff you said you like and the original query that you had from the stuff you said you didn't like. And then it goes back and it re-ranks all those results that are in that archive and gives you a new list. Now this new list is informed by the feedback that you gave, the positive and negative feedback. So it should be better, right? There should be more stuff that's relevant that, that matches your object and your query at the top of the list than the bottom of the list. And then you can give it the feedback again. Now you can look at those new items and say they're good or they're bad or, or I don't know. And you hit refine again. And the system incorporates that new information and builds classifier. And it should be a better list. It goes and re-ranks your result list again and gives you more relevant stuff near the top and less relevant stuff near the bottom. So as you might uh, guess, you can then iterate on this any number of times, right? It's just complete iteration, iteration here that feedback, refine cycle. There's really no limit on, on how many you can do. Um, typically, the system is going to have some representational limitations. There's going to be issues about what the feature vector can show really correspond to in the images and things like this. But in general, uh, you can do this a bunch of times. And you can very quickly come up through a bunch of iterations with a detector that really works for you. By quickly, I typically mean in the order of a few minutes, uh, sometimes maybe just an hour. And it's actually a lot of fun to play with this. Like, it isn't good. So architecturally, it looks like this. And when you take this pile of data we talked about before, all this big data, there's this ingest button, right? What that does in ingest is shown in the lower left here. We generate generic object detections, and we generate a descriptor for every one of those things. That generic object detections means breaking down the image into different pieces that could be different objects. 
This is important because in many, many domains, the images don't show just a single object. If there's a whole bunch of objects in an image, then any of those might be of interest to someone who is doing some research or making some queries. We don't know a priori which objects might be of interest. So we take this exhaustive approach and we just break up the image into a whole bunch of different things that could be objects. And for every one of those things, we compute one of these visual feature vectors that describes what it is. Now, it's not a classifier, right? it's just describing the image content. It has this sort of texture, it has these kinds of shapes, really um, sort of almost abstract stuff like that, but it corresponds to visual features. And you don't have to worry about any of that as a user, right? That's all the deep learning magic that's happening in the background. So we create this index when we have done this ingest process. That's down here in the middle. And then we draw on that query process that I mentioned. Take a single example and do that matching. It comes up with a bunch of similar results up here in the lower, on the upper right. And we which mark which ones we like and which ones we don't. Um, and when we do that iteration, we're going to get some level of performance. Eventually, we're going to stop. So I've done all the feedback. How's the negative I'm going to do? And at that point, I have a detector classifier. And then I can run that on new images. So I've just built myself a new classifier. and and now I can see how well it works. And so I can run on any number of new images, and maybe it's good enough, and that's great. Um, but if it is good enough, I can do more of those iterations. I can pick out more of the examples that it found and say these, these are correct and these are not. So it's all very easy. You're not even drawing any bounding boxes here. You're just looking at what the system nominated and saying yes or no. I like this or I don't. So here's an example of this process where um, you should be able to. I guess this is, can we play this video, Phil? Or are we looking at just a PDF? Yeah, you would have to uh, pull up the slides from your from your local computer if you wanted to uh, play the file, because this is just a flat PDF. OK. So if I just hit the share screen button, that should, that should do it? Yes, sir. Uh, give that a try. There we go. I'm going to share my screen. It's probably going to give you an infinite view here for a moment. Let me. Okay. Can you see the video? Bill, can you see a, uh, a video playing? Yes. Okay, great. But, all right, I'll just scan through this quickly here. All right, so and we're just going to run through a quick example and show you the system is real. Um, so the user is, is selecting a query. The ingest process has already happened. So behind the scenes here, the, the user loaded up a pile of data, uh, images and videos in this case, and then they're going to launch a, a new search. Uh, they're going to do this with a single image of an object that doesn't uh, the system doesn't know about the classifier of this particular thing. Uh, so you can load up any image you want here. Uh, and the system uh, takes that image and it looks for those objects I was talking about. So all these boxes here are potential objects. You can see some are big, some are little, all different scales. You might want to query on some tiny little piece of red thing over here, or you might want to query on this whole fish or some part of it. All these things are possible because it breaks up the image into all these different pieces. Uh, in this case, the user is interested in this fish. Uh, but note that you can, you can, again, look at the mouth of the fish or different parts. So the user picks the box that surrounds the fish, shown in green there, and then launches this query. So the system comes back um, just about that quickly there with a bunch of results uh, that are trying to match visually that fish. Now, this doesn't know about fish particularly. It just knows that there's a visual similarity between that box and, and the zillions of boxes it has in its archive. So it's pulling up the most similar pieces of imagery that match that particular query. Now, in this case, the fish is kind of a 2D problem. 
because it tends to lie on the bottom. Um, and it's a little bit easier because of the note, but it's also a camouflaged fish uh, and it can appear in a whole bunch of different orientations in the image, which, uh, which the system doesn't know yet. So we're looking at the top results here in the upper left. They're shown in rank list. The score is how similar they were to the query. And the user can scroll through all these different images and look at those results, which is what happened here. So the user can get back the results, and then the user is going through each of those results and looking at them. You can see there are different images, different instances of the same uh, type of fish. Um, so near the top of the list, it's actually pretty good. You can look at the top n results here. In this case, it's the top 20 results being shown. And you can see that most of them look like very similar fish. Uh, but then when you get down here to result like 18 or 19, we're starting to get some things that are a little different. 19 is, is, is a snail or something else, not this fish. And then number 12 here might be a different species of fish. So now the user can go through and mark off the ones that are correct uh, and the ones that are not correct. And they can do this uh, one at a time, look at each one and say, yep, I like these um, and I, I don't like these. Uh, and then you hit that refine button and the system is going to learn and come back with a better list. Okay, so here we're going through and seeing the detections in the context of the images that they came from. So there's a lot of nice user interface uh, components here. So now the system it did a refinement. Oh, sorry. Now we're looking at a lower part of the list that helps the system decide a little better. So we can also look at the, at the ones that it was very uncertain about uh, and mark off those as positive negative answers. And that helps the system converge more quickly. That's what was happening in that window. And so now we get this list after refinement, uh, which is better, right? So now we're getting more of the correct type of fish at the top of the list. You know, and we're up to the top um, few dozen, of top 40 answers here, and most of them are correct. But if you are not, we're still getting some, uh, that's a sponge, another piece of sponge. So we can mark those off as being fun, iterate and continue. And when we're done, we can save out the classifier that we created and um, and then have a detector for that type of flatfish. All right, I'm going to bring that and then go and bring up the presentation again. Bill, are you there? Can you um, pop this? All right, good, perfect. Thank okay. you. Okay, that was a quick demo of how the system actually works uh, for this uh, IQR problem. And this is all encoded programmatically underneath that that query mechanism that I mentioned in a system called the Social Media Query Toolkit. Here's an example of it working on different kinds of imagery. So not marine imagery at all. In this case, we have a query of a person playing a guitar. And in this case, the system might not know initially, I mean, it just has that feature vector describing all the content in the image. So it doesn't know if you're interested in guitars or people, or maybe this type of room, or the fact that someone is sitting down. There's all kinds of different attributes about this image that might be of interest to your user. And from the one image provided, the system doesn't know which is which. So by doing this positive or negative feedback, you're easily telling the system which ones you like, which ones you don't. And it's trying to learn from that which parts of the image you cared about. Was it guitars or people? And so in the results that come back from this query, this is the first result. So just this one image is being used here. It shows some images of guitars, some images of people with guitars, and some images of, of, uh, of just people. Uh, so you can do positive negative feedback here uh, to to say which you really want um, as we did before you say yes or no a slightly different user interface and in this case we're going to look for people with guitars so we're going to give a, uh, a negative feedback to th something that's say just a guitar um, and shown in red here we're saying we don't want just guitars and we do want people with guitars so that's what we're doing with the positive negative feedback on, on this example. And then we get this result here. So we do that refine process, the system did the, an updating, learn from those, just those handful of, of uh, adjudicated instances, and it comes back with this result. And so now it has people in guitars, but now it's showing a lot of people because we didn't have any negative results showing just people before and say, don't show me just people. So now it's really 
probing that feature space and saying, well, you know, these, these things do match that original image. Um, and so now you can say negatively, I don't want these images because they don't have guitars. Uh, so with negative feedback on those, you get back these results. And now we're getting many more people with guitars uh, and even banjos. Now, maybe you don't want banjos. So you could say negative, negative on the banjos, or maybe you just want people with stringed instruments that are strumming instruments that, that, uh, that one could play. So it's really up to you. This is why you can customize it to your specificity, right? If you wanted guitars specifically and not banjos, then you can mark the banjos as negative. Okay, so that's the, the, the DIY part in general uh, with the image query refinement part. Um, one of the other aspects, though, that, that we've worked on quite a bit um, on a number of DARPA programs uh, and um, other, other programs, too, is called explainable AI. I'll talk about what this means, but this is a unique aspect of, that's available in some of the tools that we've created. So on the XAI program, which concluded last year, uh, DARPA uh, was looking at this problem, particularly motivated by deep learning, of trying to explain what the network is using to make a decision. This is very difficult because these networks are very, very large with tens of millions of parameters, even hundreds of millions now. Um, and so it's tough to understand and trust a model uh, when it has such an inscrutable mechanism for making its decisions. So it's um, XAI looked at a variety of, of methods to make deep learning models more explainable. Uh, and we've used some of these uh, in the work I'm that, uh, that I just showed, we're gonna add in explainability into this uh, IQR process. So the program did a number of, of, of great works in explainable AI and, and really moved the air aspect forward of, of, of AI in, in, um, in explainable models. Uh, and there was a, there's now workshops on explainable AI at our AI conferences and it's a legitimate topic uh, for publication, which was not true before the program started. And looking at the program formulation, and these are DARPA slides from the, from the program itself, um, explainable AI is really for humans. It's not typically for algorithms to look at the explanations, but for humans. Now, there are some algorithmic aspects to it that, that people have incorporated since. But really, these expl explanations are for a human to look at and say, this helps me understand the algorithm and uh, makes me do my job better. So the part we're going to focus on the most here is the end users and soldiers part in the middle. Um, where someone is trying to use AI system, and really that IQR system I just described is an AI system, and we're going to add explainability into that so that the end user can do a better job at their task, uh, a better job in that, uh, that query refinement process using explainability. Now, we might worry that, that adding explainability and making interpretable models can degrade performance. Um, what we found and we're, we're looking to see is, can performance get better? Can a human plus the algorithm working together improve their accuracy or efficiency or both because of explainability? And we were, we were able to show this, uh, particularly for harder cases where explainability adds more value. We're going to use saliency maps as explainability. It's a very common intuitive form of explainability. Um, on the lower left here, you can see an image that shows a dog and a cat. And if we're going to try to rec recognize what's in this image as a classifier, we might have a classifier for a dog and a classifier for a cat. And for the result where the dog classifier, uh, the dog result was given, so the classification of the image was, was labeled as dog, we can compute a heat map which says which part pixels in the image were the most important for deciding that the image showed a dog using an algorithm called GradCam, which is a very popular way to do visual saliency. And it shows here that the dog is really covered up and the cat is pretty much ignored. And so it's accurate. In this case, the dog correction, the dog classification was correct. And the explanation shows that the pixels the algorithm paid attention to to make a dog decision were in fact on the dog. Well, that's reassuring. So I didn't pay attention to the, to the carpet or to the cat or something. It, it paid attention to the dog pixels. Over on the right, um, we have saliency for similarity between two images. So the image on the left and the image on the right are being compared together. And the saliency on the right is showing which part of the image on the right matches some part of the image on the left. And in this case, the horse is what matches, right? It's different people. The people are similar-ish too, 
Um, but it's really um, a very similar horse uh, in the two images there. And the one on the right, uh, the salience is shown on the right image. We could equivalently do this on the left and parts of the left image match those on the right. And then down below, um, an image of sheep, um, a classification of sheep. The, um, the white sheep is, is classified uh, as contributing to the sheep decision on this image. The black one is not. So in this case, the algorithm, the model didn't really know about black sheep. Now, black box versus white box, don't worry about it much here, but it just means whether you have insight into the algorithm itself and the model parameters. Um, we're looking at black box methods uh, primarily, which means you can use it on any algorithm without knowing how the algorithm worked or having access to the internal parameters of that uh, AI model. So the way saliency works in the RQR setting is uh, the RQR setting is the same as we saw before. We have an image archive. We build some index on it. In this case, we're actually using the Facebook index. And then we're going to have some query um, image like this. And in this case, it shows the cat and the dog, um, but we are really looking for cat. So the retrieve list is going to show us maybe cats and dogs together or dogs and cats. We're going to go through and and um, and do that adjudication just as we saw before. It's going to create this binary classifier in this refinement loop. So all of this is stuff we just talked about and showed the demo of. But now we're going to add in this explainability piece. And so when these results came back and it said cats and dogs in this image, uh, these are the rank list. And was, and these are similar to the to the query. We can now add in that saliency map part and say which parts of the image in each of these results match that query. And then the user can know whether the match was correct based on not just the whole image, but the specific parts of the image and give feedback based on this additional knowledge. So not just looking at the whole image, but now looking at which parts of the image match. And it turns out that's really useful because sometimes the algorithm gets the right answer, but for the wrong reasons, right? It's, it's finding something and matching against something in the image that the analyst actually didn't. And I won't go through the algorithm here, uh, how it works, but in general, we're trying to differentiate this right for the right reasons versus right for the wrong reasons. So we did a user study on this. Um, a few user studies, actually, in Mechanical Turk. Uh, and in some cases, we had 476 subjects uh, running a bunch of different queries and got a bunch of results around this to determine whether doing this IQR process with saliency is better than using the IQR process just, just on its own. So we gave them a user interface like this, where their goal was to find all the images in an archive that contain a wine glass. And they were given um, a query initially and then a set of results. So they went through that IQR process and they did it with the saliency maps and without the saliency maps. So what the saliency map would show them is an image like this here on the left. There's a bunch of wine glasses and a bunch of wine bottles. And the saliency map highlights what the algorithm paid attention to to retrieve this particular image. And if it paid attention to things that are not the wine glass, then you might give it a negative. You might say, I don't want returns like that. In this case here on the right, it's paying attention to the wine bottle much more so than the wine glass. So you might give that a negative uh, rating. Uh, the one below it, it's, it is paying attention to the wine glasses. So you might give that one a positive rating. Without the saliency map, you give both of these positive ratings, but that might confuse the system because now it thinks you're looking for wine bottles and not wine glasses. So differentiation within the image is, is can be critical here in the more complex images when there's a lot of objects there, when objects are small, things like this. So we expected and hoped that the saliency maps would help in more complicated cases. And that's what turned out to be true. So it's a little interesting in this plot, um, but to the right, is the benefit of explainability. So the farther we are to the right, the more benefit we have from explainability. And then from bottom to top is easier to harder cases, which is rated here by the number of objects in the image. So you can see this trend from lower left to upper right. What that says is that in the easier cases, when we have fewer objects in the scene, we get less benefit or no benefit from explainability. And when we have more objects in the scene, let's move to the uh, move up in the y-axis, then we get greater uh, in benefit from explainability here to the right. And on average, we have this all quantified. In difficult cases, we got 6.5% uh, better results and more, more 
uh, instances retrieved. In the average case, we got 2.7. So it's not compelling in the average, but on the more difficult cases, as we uh, had expected, uh, then we get a significantly greater benefit from, from explaining. This is important to measure because there is a cost to explainability. We have to compute this extra saliency map step, and that, that can be computationally demanding at times. Um, so what we showed from all of this is that um, with explainability, a human working with the algorithm together improves performance. Right? So it's not just explainability for its own sake so that you can trust the algorithm more, which is important, but we actually have a case here where explainability um, improves performance overall. Right? The human and the algorithm together do a better job because of explainability. And that's not always the case. Right? Sometimes explainability is really just there to build justified trust in an algorithm, which is very important uh, and helps here. But ideally, adding in explainability and maybe other ethical AI aspects um, would actually improve the human and the machine working together. So that's a, an important result that was uh, a hope for the XAI program. And in this case, uh, for, for these conditions, it does prove to be true. We had some, some qualitative feedback in the sense that we gave the user surveys uh, to measure trust and how much they like having explainability maps, whether it improves their uh, understanding of the system and so on. And in, in general, those results were quite positive. 83% of people thought that the explainability helped them understand uh, the algorithm better. 60% uh, thought it helped them give better feedback uh, and so on. We did a similar study on a more relevant data set for perhaps this community, intelligence community, and so on, uh, on XView, which is an overhead imagery data set that NGA put together with uh, DIU. Uh, in this case, it was an aircraft type of problem where uh, the images were a fixed size. So they showed not just, uh, say, one aircraft, maybe multiple ones, multiple objects in the scene, lots of background and tarmac and things like this. So we ran the same study where there was a query image the goal was to retrieve aircraft of a particular type, uh, or maybe it was just aircraft overall. Um, I think there were maybe 60 classes in XView, and we chose uh, a subset of those classes for these experiments. And, um, and the ground truth is provided on XView for um, hundreds of thousands of instances of these objects scattered across uh, seven or 800 uh, large, uh, large images with, with good resolution. So it's a very extensive data set which was very useful for our purposes because it's fully ground truth. So you can see the saliency maps here matching this query. Sometimes they're on the aircraft and sometimes they aren't. So when the, when the saliency is not on the aircraft, then the user could mark the, the result as incorrect uh, or inconclusive and leave it blind, but not a positive result. And so this um, also was then used to guide convergence to, to doing an aircraft detector. Uh, you can see some of the saliency maps here uh, on the right. Uh, corresponding to these aircraft. And the in-class saliency maps versus out-of-class saliency maps are very interesting to look at. So the saliency maps for the aircraft that actually match are shown in the upper half of this figure on the right. Saliency maps for um, for images that, that don't show uh, a correct results um, tend to be uh, more scattered and on the background. And as the system, as the system gets iterations with the user, the user gives it more feedback, the saliency maps actually sharpen up. There's actually a little video here that I can't play uh, right now, but the saliency maps actually improve uh, through those iterations, as, uh, as you might expect. So the, the system knows now more about what the algorithm, what the user is looking for, more information, uh, and saliency actually improves uh, on the objects uh, the more iterations uh, you get. Okay, so I'll wrap up with just a, a little bit of a um, description of how you can do this yourself again. So coming back to the DIY part of this explainable AI, this has been packaged up into what we call the XAI toolkit, which was an add-on to the XAI program from, from DARPA. So the XAI program ended about a year ago. It developed much more than saliency maps. So we did the work I just described on that program, but others did a lot of work on saliency maps, as well as all kinds of other explainability uh, solutions in the autonomy and analytics spaces. So this is all put together into the XAI toolkit, which you can see at this URL here. Um, it's a very, very heterogeneous level of integration in this toolkit, right? So the, there is a lot of maturity in the saliency map part. 
um, other things though are independent contributions that really just share a common repository. So lots of performers on the program contributed their, their final systems, their demos and so on into this toolkit. So it's really almost like a shopping mall of XAI. You can go there and look at all the different things people did on the program uh, and see if any of those might be suitable for you. Um, there's different licensing in those different tools, depending on what each uh, contributor uh, was able to or was uh, desired to constrain. Uh, so you have to look at that uh, separately. And we can't say, for example, that everything in here is open source and permissively licensed. Right? So the software, the components from Kitware certainly are, but uh, there are many components from other companies and universities and so on that each have their own uh, own licensing. But there's also publications from the program are all listed here in kind of a one-stop shop. These are the institutions that contributed to the toolkit. It's not a complete set of everything on the program. So these are folks who, who put their stuff in there uh, voluntarily. Uh, and there's other things on the program that, that are not in the toolkit itself. But there is a lot of stuff in there from a lot of premier universities and professors and researchers and companies working on these explainability problems. There's a bit more on the analytics side and the autonomy side. In autonomy, it's all about decision making. So why did the algorithm for, say, a self-driving car choose to go right versus go left? Why did it stop versus accelerate? Uh, those kinds of problems uh, are in the autonomy algorithms. Stanley C maps, visual maps, as I showed, are probably the most well fleshed out part of the script. There's a lot there, um, a bunch of different ways to do saliency with different conditions about whether you have access to the internals of the model or not, white box versus black box, uh, methods for what the saliency is supposed to be for. So it's, uh, it's, it's fun to explore that, what kind of labeling you might have to build saliency, uh, to train the saliency uh, map detectors. All of that uh, varies quite a bit. On autonomy, there's a lot of work in the game playing area. So, um, not familiar with this work in, in reinforcement learning, for example, there's a lot of playing of video games and then using simulators uh, to learn controllers. Uh, and with explainability, you can now have explainable controllers, whether they're post hoc, where the controller is built and then you explain it afterwards, or you try to build an explainable controller. So if you're interested in autonomy control problems, uh, there's a fair amount there in the toolkit. And just highlighting one of these, an air interaction review, and why did this strategic game playing system make its decisions at any point in time? Um, there's an explainability method here um, built by uh, Oregon State University um, that does a very nice job and has a user interface uh, that shows this. There are interesting user interfaces and demos in the tool because, if, as uh, we mentioned, explainability here is for humans, right? It's for people to look at. So there was a fair amount of attention paid to that human user interface part on the program, which makes for nice demos and intuitive uh, a look at what's, what capabilities are, are available. So the toolkit is available uh, online. Anyone can go there. There's a variety of demos in it, as I mentioned. Uh, the saliency part of this is its own toolkit here maintained on GitHub. Uh, that is well integrated. That's a um, professional quality code. Uh, so it's beyond research code. It's been the most uh, well-developed part of the program. Uh, there are uh, fairly mature pieces uh, else outside of saliency scattered across the toolkit, and then there's a lot of research code in there too. So uh, each independent contributed piece uh, will have its own level of, of uh, software and maintenance and things like that. There's a paper describing this as well, uh, shown here at this link. There's a website I mentioned uh, you can contribute to it. Uh, so this is not limited to people who are contributors on the XAI program. Um, it's really open to anyone. We hope that, that people will uh, make their own contributions and use this as a clearinghouse for XAI methods, particularly for government work and government problems. But there's, again, no limitation there. So feel free to take a look. And if you have an XAI algorithm or model to contribute, then uh, please do. It would be uh, very welcome to get more contributions. Of you. The saliency package uh, is in Python. Um, it's pretty mature. It allows you to use the saliency algorithms that are there on sets of images, um, uh, play with the parameters, look at the results. It's integrated in the Jupyter Notebooks if you like that interface. 
Uh, it's also um, extensible, so you can modify those algorithms or, or even better, add in your own using the same API and then everyone else figures it too. We've been using saliency maps for model debugging, just another instance of this. So we talked a lot about image retrieval, but um, there is a lot of use of saliency to figure out which algorithm is better than another, which one is likely to generalize more, or what's wrong with my algorithm? Why is it not detecting the right stuff? Um, so they're very useful for for AI engineers researchers to, to do debugging, um, but they're also useful for, uh, for rating algorithms, um, one versus versus another. And some of the transition partners we're talking to are actually very interested in that particular problem, is uh, which algorithm is better than another. Um, if the scores are equivalent, I can look at saliency maps and, and maybe get more confidence in one versus another. So the software framework behind this, I won't go into it, but it's a, a mature system built on SMQTK um, that does all these uh, the sales maps and analytics in there, as well as the site to our extensions. There's different levels of integration uh, with the XI Toolkit. Mostly we focused on the black box system where up here in the upper right, where you have an AI system and then you have some kind of explainability that runs that AI system, generates a bunch of outputs by perturbing inputs. That's how saliency maps work. And that way you don't know or depend on what's inside that AML box. That's the most practical form if you have an algorithm that someone has given you and you want to do some explainability on top of it. So uh, just to wrap up, uh, we have this Viami toolkit and the XAI toolkit um, that are there for, for you to try uh, to do uh, analytics in, in AI, no programming or machine learning um, required. Uh, the Viami system is the most um, performant. Uh, it has uh, these user interfaces and is used by uh, dozens, maybe hundreds of people. We don't really know. Um, but it you know, goes, goes well beyond the maritime domain. Initially, that's what it was intended for. Uh, but it's been used across a variety of domains and imagery from space borne imagery, terrestrial, uh, undersea, all kinds of imagery has been applied within the army. The explainability part uh, can improve user performance in these difficult problems in the search and retrieval task. Um, the explainability piece is not in Viami yet, although we are adding it soon, hopefully, but uh, the explainability in Viami yet are not the same. But XAITK is a way for that explainability to be available for everyone, uh, and you can uh, go and try it out and contribute. So much. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation. A lot of uh, interesting information in there. Um, right now, we'll start the Q&A session. So if you have any questions for the presenter, uh, feel free to enter those in using the view audience questions uh, tool. That's the chat bubble um, in the middle top of your screen. Uh, we actually do have one question already, so I'll queue that up now. So our first question comes from Robert Russell. Any suggestions for saliency concepts for non-image classifiers, how to determine saliency, and how to incorporate feedback? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I mentioned this um, in, at the beginning that a lot of these methods would apply to non-image data. Um, the most, the most common non-image data that, that saliency has been applied to that I'm aware of is, is text. So you can have a natural language processing system, which is doing some kind of text analysis, for example, um, topic detection or classification of documents into different predefined categories. Uh, and which text contributed the most to that decision uh, is a very natural extension of all of this. So um, if you have a, a paragraph and it was classified as being um, hostile or informative or whatever your classifier is trying to do, um, which words or phrases contributed the most to that decision? So saliency maps have been applied directly to this. So which of the, uh, the parts of that input um, work? Because in the end, it's just feature vectors. So Saliency is just saying which dimensions of the input feature vectors mattered. Uh, so anything you put into a feature vector um, will work for this. So basically anything in a vector space, um, the same saliency concepts uh, work. So and then a little bit beyond that too, there's also saliency for graphical methods. Um, it's largely we, what we do in deep learning with graphs is put them into um, a feature space, uh, a vector feature space, um, and then convert them back. So also uh, graphical saliency now is um, that's been done. 
And how to incorporate okay. feedback uh, is a good question in uh, the second part of this um, for non-image classifiers. It's the same thing. So again, the feedback loop is just working in that vector space. So um, it it's just going to take the um, the saliency map, overlay it on that on that that image, which corresponds to the input space, and then um, when the when the feedback is is computed is incorporated into this classifier, we actually incorporate the uh, the saliency map into that classifier update, and that's done at the vector level, so it doesn't depend on the form of the input. Now we're in that vector space again, so that incorporation of feedback with saliency maps uh, actually takes the the saliency map into account, uh, mapped onto the image, and builds a better classifier based on that saliency map. So the saliency map in in some of our experiments has actually been used directly and the results I showed it isn't but in other experiments we've done saliency map actually is used computationally not just for the human to look at um, and that would apply to to non-image uh, problems also again it's just working on, my, on those vectors perfect thank you uh, we have another question that came in from our audience um, from Michael, the mention of facial recognition, can we use XAITK to develop our own? Um, yes, you could. Uh, so you can build any image classifier using the IQR methods that I described, uh, including facial ones. Uh, we haven't done this, um, at least not, not in any way that I could quote results on, but the a face, the way face recognition systems work is every individual is a class, right? So it's like a huge N-way class problem. I have at K individuals, I'm going to have K classes, one per individual. Um, this is for recognition, not facial detection. Um, and so you typically um, you build this big classifier that knows about all these individuals and given face image is put in and, and which uh, the likelihood for each of the K is computed and the top. Most likely ones, it's uh, usually indicated as the individual. So uh, explainability in this case has been done on faces. So we, I don't have any examples here, but it would show you which parts of the face contributed to that decision. So was it the eyebrows or the eyes or lips or whatever? Uh, so explainability on faces has been explored uh, a fair amount. Uh, and you could use XAITK to do facial recognition, but we have not done that. Thank you. Um, seems that's all the questions we have. I have a, a, a couple personal questions as well. Uh, I saw that SMQTK was web-based. Uh, VIAME, um, it seemed from the demo that that was a desktop application. Can you speak to the system requirements uh, for VIAME? VIAME is both. Um, so we go back to well, we go back to a slide if we want to. But I showed the, the demo that I showed of Yami was the desktop version. And Yami was originally developed as a desktop user interface, uh, and then we developed a web-based user interface over the past three or four years. So on the web version, there is slightly less functionality, but uh, everything I showed in the demo uh, is available in the web version. I just don't have a demo video for that uh, to show here. Um, and mostly people are using the web version now. So if you go to viami.kitware.com, which is uh, URL in the slides there, um, you can actually try it out yourself. So there's an, a hosted instance of Viami uh, on the web. Uh, you have to set up a user account, but then you can just try it. You can upload your own data. Uh, not too much data, please. It's our, our server. But you, if you have uh, some sample data or example data you want to, to use Viami on your own data, you, know, you can put it up there. Uh, and then try out Viami on your data. You can also look at Viami results and play with it on the large amounts of data that others have loaded there. It's mostly maritime data. So that's viami.kitware.com, or else one of these slides. Thank you. Um, from, a, from a DOD perspective, uh, lots of times that's a question that we get uh, based on the uh, definitive uh, low swap requirements that they have. Um, so obviously there are plenty of applications where uh, I can see this technology being used um, at the tactical edge. Um, the only other question I have, this will probably be the last one we'll wrap up. I know we're, we're slightly over one o'clock. 
a couple months ago, we also had a webinar on adversarial AI, uh, spoken about, uh, speaking about possibly deceiving the algorithms. We you, we hear uh, anecdotal stories of, you know, reflector tape on stop signs to kind of deceive the algorithms for self-driving vehicles and things like that. Uh, can you speak to um, any if any of your work um, is relevant to that space of adversarial AI? Over. Sure, that's a good question. Um... Before I jump to that, though, I forgot about the computational side. So, Yami runs on on the um, on the web, as I mentioned, and then where is computation happening? In that case, it's happening on this Yami server, which is a single GPU. Um, the training part, the IQR part, doesn't take much much computation. The ingest can take a bit of time, but deep learning training is what always takes a lot of computation. So, if you're building a new detector. In a deep learning training sense, you had a bunch of labels and you didn't want to do a new deep learning model, which people do all the time with Yami. That can take hours or even days, depending on the model, how much data you gave it, uh, how long you wanted to data rate. Um, so there's nothing special about Yami in that one way or the other. We're just using existing models that are out there. So the typical constraints around computation and deep learning uh, would apply. But when you run Yami, um, it's quick because uh, any, most of these models, the huge majority of the computation is in the training of the model. So once you have a detector, you can run it quickly. And that IQR process doesn't do any deep learning training. So that's all very quick uh, as well. So there's no training in that. And so it requires a pretty lightweight GPU just to run processing on each image, but not, not this huge iterative uh, training process that one needs for a new model. So in general, you can do a lot with uh, very little computation using uh, Biami or SM2, SMQTK uh, out of the box. And then if you need to train a new model, then it's the standard deep learning training computation questions. Um, so in terms of, um, what, was it, what was the second part? That was the computation part. Oh, it was about adversarial AI. Ah, right, sorry. So adversarial AI is um, a great topic. The one, one advantage of explainability for adversarial AI is the saliency map can tell you when the algorithm is paying attention to stuff that you don't think it should be. So in the examples you gave, like the stop sign with the sticker on it and so on, some physical attacks, when the, when the algorithm misclassifies the stop sign as a speed limit sign, um, it's doing this by, by being nefariously directed to a small number of pixels on the stop sign. So he puts a piece of tape on the stop sign and it gets misclassified. The saliency map will actually show that, right? It'll show that the algorithm is paying attention to this, this sticker, this little part in the center of the stop sign instead of the whole sign. Uh, so this is a well-known phenomenon. And some of the folks working on uh, adversarial AI and the guard program, which is the ARPA program on this, have, uh, are also on the XAI program and have, have exploited this, this phenomenon. So you can visually catch a, an adversarial attack in a way by looking at saliency maps. Uh, you can do it by quantifying saliency maps too. So you can automatically quantify them. If the saliency is too focused on a very small part of the image consistently, then you might very well have a poisoned uh, detector classifier. Uh, that's one of the strong cues because you know, it keeps paying attention to these very small pieces of the image instead of the whole um, set of parts that define an object. So I would recommend looking at saliency for if you have an adversarial concern and so on, you can you can try saliency maps and see if they reveal this. There's also a demo in the XAI toolkit, I believe, from CMU um, that uh, that looks at this problem. They have a very nice user interface that shows how saliency reveals the focusing of um, of, of the algorithm's attention on um, on the adversarial input. Thank you very much. Um, so we did go slightly over this month, but I think it was well worth it. Um, I think we had a great presentation today, a lot of interesting information. I would like to thank Anthony again uh, for sticking with us. Uh, we rescheduled this particular webinar about three or four times, so we were happy to to get his time today. Uh, the The recording will be up in a couple of days, so please check back to the website um, with a topic like this. Um, you know, focused on computer vision is something I will definitely check back on YouTube and go go back through uh, the slides myself. Um, and just to kind of reiterate, re reiterate one of the points that Anthony mentioned, this is open source software. Um, so that community collaboration um, is definitely uh, more than welcome. Um, but with that said, I'll, I'll let everyone go.
and we will see you next month for our next CSI webinar. Thank you. Appreciate you listening, everybody. Take care.